Look, let me just dive right in and, uh, and uh, try, to, try to save some time, but I do not want to cheat you tonight. I believe God has a word for us. And so last week, if you were here, we, we, I taught on a message called the four R's of growth and influence. And um, really, honest to God, I thought this was a one-up message. And it wasn't until Monday when I was out on my walk that the Lord began to prompt my heart about this, that the majority of what I talked about when it came to growth and influence was related to how we, we relate to God vertically. But he began to stir within me the importance then of how these four R's of growth and influence operate and interact horizontally, meaning how we relate one, one to another and how especially how we relate to people outside these doors who have yet to encounter who Jesus is. So the four R's, if you missed it, no worries. I encourage you always to go to our website. You can listen to the message again. But I'll tell you, they, uh, they stand for R is receive. The second R was to respond the third R was to release, and the fourth R was to replace. And to, tonight, I want to, again, as I already mentioned, lay a foundation for how this pertains to growth and influence in this direction, how we operate here on this plane, on, in this realm. And, and, and you probably have heard me talk many times that I, my soapbox is never about getting people to sign up to make you know, heavenly timeshares. My soapbox is never about soliciting um, fire insurance to get people out of hell. I, if I use those tactics, it feels cheap to me, right? It's not that I don't have an opinion on those two topics. And thank you, Jesus, that one day this transition, this suit's going to wear out and there's going to be another realm. But that's not the thing that we dangle, okay? I, I feel like it's cheating who Jesus is if I have to sell that in order to just saying, you know what? Jesus is good and he gave his life for you and he wants your life to be different. And, and if we understand that this is the foundation, uh, because I, I ask myself routinely, week after week, Lord, what do you want to come out of my mouth? What should be coming out of my mouth every week? And, and furthermore, what should our church be known for? What should our church be, be projecting into the community? We've had prophetic words over our church that, that called us a lighthouse, a beacon that would go into the darkness, that would shine bright and far. And I believe that. And so what I keep coming back to week after week is simply this. Jesus is perfect theology. If you want to know what God looks like, study what Jesus did. The gospel is not just saying thank you for what you've done for me. The gospel is actually imitating what Jesus did. The gospel is a role model. Jesus prototyped himself what it looked like to be a God-man, to be spirit-filled woman or man, how to live in this realm like Jesus did. And we're called to watch this out like Jesus did. And so Amago Dei is where I'll first begin. This is a Latin phrase, which simply means image of God, image of God. And this is, this is a phrase that finds its origin in Genesis chapter one, verse number 27, wherein God created man in his own image. This passage does not imply that God is in human form, but that humans are in God's image. This is important because the implications of this doctrine, the imago dei in the image of God, it's apparent that the fact that humans are to love God, then humans must also love other humans as it's, uh, as it's also equally an expression of who God is. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's a test, but I'm gonna give you the answers, okay? So no pressure, but you have to respond, okay? This is Monday night participation time, okay? And if you just want to give me a head nod, that, head nod, that's okay. You can do that. But how many know that God is perfect? Yes, yes right? I mean, so be, the fact that God is perfect, this way, he is really easy to love because he's perfect, right? How many know that on this plane, not everybody's perfect? Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone have any difficult situations or relationships in their life? Some of y'all are sitting next to your difficult relationship. I'm not looking at you. <laughs> And don't look at your spouse, okay? But the fact is, there are people in your life that are difficult. And guess what, big shot? You're difficult sometimes, right? And so loving God is one aspect of it, but loving others is equally important. This isn't just our challenge. This is not just the message for 2021 going into 2022. This is not just the American challenge. This is the challenge of humanity. And this is the challenge that Jesus faced as well. Jesus was always getting challenged by these religious leaders, teachers of the law, hoping to catch him up or snare him in something that he would say that they could use it against him. And in such a case, in Mark chapter 12, there's a teacher of the law that's going to try to catch Jesus on something. And in verse number 28, 
one of the teachers of religious law, was standing there listening to this debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well, so he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is equally important. Someone say equally. equally. The second is equally important to loving God with all of your strength. He goes on to say, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. So the question begs to be asked, what is love? Because love seems to be a moving target. Love seems to be thrown out very effortlessly. Love ya. You know, we, we text it. You know, we, we say it. Um, I think we throw it around and we don't even understand the implications and the weight of love. And it makes me nervous anytime someone says this phrase, the Bible clearly says. Anytime someone says the Bible clearly says, I know they've not studied the Bible very much. Because the Bible doesn't say a lot of things super clearly because it was written in an ancient text and we shouldn't take it casually. It's been a minute since I gave the analogy, but you never want to be the person that says, God, speak to me. Pluck out my eye, right? You need to understand in context. If you take it out of context, you just have a con. Okay, I got to stay on track here. So what is love? And in this particular case, the Bible does help us with a pretty clear answer. It starts out in 1 John 4, 10. This is love. He loved us long before we loved him. It was his love, not ours. He proved it by sending his son to be the pleasing sacrificial offering to take away our sins. Love engages. Love makes the first move. This is love. Not that we did something to earn it or deserve it, But while we were at our worst, which I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, while we were at our worst, Jesus demonstrated what love looks like by coming and taking on flesh and blood, taking on all of the temptations and challenges that you and I face. It was quite a downgrade to leave the heavenlies, to come outside of time and come into time so that he could engage with us. And then instead of just taking on like a militant Messiah, we found a merciful one. And God began to show us er, through Jesus what his real heart and his real intention is. So this week, the first R, still receive. And I'm gonna go back to the opening passage that I used last week, Ephesians chapter two, verse number eight. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. We're not saved by grace alone. We're saved by grace through faith. Grace is what God has provided. Faith is my proper response, my positive response. And it's a gift from God. Everything that comes from God needs to be simply received. If it's anything other than that, if you could earn it or pay for it, you've lost the value of it being a gift. And and the, the fact is that with every aspect of the kingdom of God, we need to learn how to be receivers. It is God's grace. Now, grace is an interesting topic that over the last 10 or 15 years has really grown in popularity. People will literally ask me, well, Pastor Phil, is believers one of those grace churches? And of course we are, but I've learned that I don't answer that way no longer because now we're just an us and them. What I would say is that we're a Jesus-centered church. So grace is more than just unmerited favor. It is unmerited favor, but it's more than that. I wrote down three things that I think we should understand about grace. And I'm not encompassing it all, but I think it's important to inject it here. That grace is love that seeks you out when you have nothing to give in return. Grace is something that seeks you out when you have nothing to give in return. The second aspect of grace is grace is love coming at you that has nothing to do with you. It's not your decision whether someone gives you a, a gift or an inheritance That's the determination of the person who who assigns you as the inheritor of their inheritance. Grace is coming at you and has nothing to do with you. And finally, grace is being loved when you are unlovable. When you are unlovable. Romans chapter five, verse number eight, the apostle Paul reminds us, but Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly. You see, grace 
find you at your worst. His reckless grace, his reckless generosity, he gave of himself in anticipation, in hopes that we would receive it. So, so grace is more than just unmerited favor. Grace invades spaces of those who are lost and ungodly before you could ever earn it or deserve it. Now, a church culture like this, we, we uh, I don't know about you, but I have some church past, okay? Not all of it was great. I learned some, some of it, I learned great tools and other things about church culture, I learned what not to do, Right? In this life, you're a teacher of something, right? You're a teacher of good things, or you can teach people what not to do. Some of you, I uh, see you nodding your head. Maybe you came from some culture. I have this crazy notion, and I wasn't alone, that churches were just for Christians. You know that there's room for people who don't believe yet, right? Okay. I got scared there. I'm like, I got to change my message. If you're here tonight, I want to reassure you, you can belong before you ever believe. We, we invite you. You are our guests. And, and so inside this, this culture that we call the body of Christ, we are called to unity and diversity. Unity and diversity. A healthy church should have every aspect and every point or mile marker of maturity in the faith, from no faith at all to those who have been walking with Jesus. Unity and diversity. We must stop assuming. I promise you, there's people near you or down the road from you that don't know the stuff. The words on the songs, they don't know. Tell them to turn to Mark. They're like, what? How do I, how do I find that? We, we, we assume too much. I've also, I've also been embarrassed when I assumed that just because people were church attending for decades that they actually knew something about God. Found out. That's a lie, okay? I was, that was for you, Grace. Okay, so diversity with, uni- with uh, unity with diversity, it would be far easier, it would be extremely easy for, for you and I to have a church of uniformity. And there's plenty of churches like that. Uniformity would be those who look like you, who vote like you, dress like you, and even act like you. If we wanted uniformity, we probably could get away with this section right here, and we'd all look alike, and we'd all dress alike, and we'd all vote alike, and we become this small bless me club. And what happens when you turn incestuous like this? You get mean. Sorry to use you as my, my, my section, but uh, I'm talking about the chair count, not the people in the middle here. And so what happens is you become so mean and you start pointing at all the bad people out there when the reality is that we're supposed to be like this because Jesus died for us all. Amen. Amen. So it's diversity with unity, not uniformity. And so this receiving that happens, we've been received by God. He starts a journey where we're at. So our proper response needs to be, we receive people where they're at. We, we follow the example of Jesus. He descended and started the journey with us. He never expected us to climb to where he was because we can't get there. And he's taking us on this journey. So we need to receive people. We're talking about the four R's of growth and influence. Last week, this way. This week, we're talking this way. The second one would be respond, okay? So the grace of God is a gift. It's something that you are a recipient of. It's totally up to you to receive it or not. So if it's a gift that's been given to us, wouldn't it be natural then, the proper response to give grace away? But isn't it true that that's not altogether common? Ouch, but it's true. In fact, we love grace when we blow it. We don't always like giving grace when other people blow it though. It's true, it's part of the human condition. How many are familiar with the song, Amazing Grace? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. me. Sometimes I think we sing it that way, but what we're really thinking is, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like thee. (laughs) If we're not careful, we will take grace for granted and we won't give it as freely as it's been given to us. An unfortunate reality is most times we are masterful with microscopes, but terrible with mirrors. Gulp, right? That was a hard one even to read. And it's true. And this is a challenge of humanity. It's not, again, our new issue. Jesus was dealing with this as well. In Matthew 7, verse number 3, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that's in your own eye? 
Or how can you say to your brother, let me take this speck out of your eye and look, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then, you'll be, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Can I summarize this, this passage with this statement? Before there can be restoration, there must first be recognition. Recognition. I don't know how the proper grammar goes, but you, you know how... You know, the Lord doesn't talk in English. He speaks in truth, right? So he'll, that, that, that's how it explains where the Lord will deposit something in you in a millisecond, but it'll take you a week to unpack it, right? So the Lord was speaking to me one day and, and, and how I processed it. I'm, not sure, I'm sure the Lord has great grammar. The way I processed it was, I need to own it so that it stops owning me. It's taking responsibility, the ability to respond. It's recognition So there can be restoration. Recognition of what? Recognition that if you see differently, it is because Jesus has opened your eyes. It's recognition that if you're free in any area of your life, it's because Jesus has set you free. Recognition that if you're alive in Christ today, it's because Jesus died for you. It's a recognition that if you are holy in any way, shape, or form, it is because you have been discipled and loved well. The process of developing a a holy life or a a, a life of conviction is a process that we're called to help people with. And we talked about last week, there aren't hoops to jump through. There aren't ladders to climb. We start the journey right where they're at, receiving them, responding with grace. It's it's reciprocating. It's, It's not being a hypocrite or being someone with spiritual amnesia, okay? If you've walked with Jesus for a while, you might have forgotten, but you have a BC day. Remember? Maybe some of you, it's so long that you forgot what it's like when you were at the helm, when you were running this thing. I know for me, I ran this thing into the ditch. Jesus found me in the guttermost, and he's taking me to the uttermost. Amen? Amen. 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 Romans chapter 7, verse number 18, it's recognition. The Apostle Paul, if there's ever anyone who could boast and brag about his lineage, his ability, his knowledge, his training, it was him. He even went so far as to say the law, I kept it perfectly, which I don't understand at all how he got away with that statement. But he says this about himself, for I know that nothing good lives within the flesh of my fallen humanity. The longings to do what is right are within me, but my willpower is not enough to accomplish it. In and of ourselves, if left to our own devices, we will run this thing to the grave. If left to our own ability and desires, we will go too far. We will find ourselves in sin and death. So in and of ourselves, it's not that. It is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we had a great time in worship. How many felt the presence of God in this place? It was wonderful, but you know the Holy Spirit is more than a goosebump. The Holy Spirit is more than just an expression that we feel. In fact, the the Holy Spirit is described by Jesus. Hey, open up, phone. The Holy Spirit says, it says when he he opened up the ancient text and he began to read Isaiah, the Holy Spirit, uh, verse number 18 of chapter four of Luke, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me, empowered me, in other words, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released and the blind will see. The oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord of favor has come. The Holy Spirit upon you is to do something, to empower you to do what you could not do. If we're gonna be people who embrace the gospel, it says, thank you, and now I mimic or I imitate or I take that next step as the body of Christ. He is the head, we are the body, we are the hands and feet. So in and of ourselves, no. But can I also make a distinction between pride and proud? Pride is rooted in the lie and exaggeration, but proud is rooted in love and truth. There, if you have to tell a story and exaggerate or make things up, well, that's pride because there's insecurity there. But there's plenty of you that if I came through and asked you about different mile markers of your life, you should be proud. Becky and I are going to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary in January. I'm proud of that. I don't take credit. She has to live with me, okay? I understand that. 
but by the grace of God, I'm not like I was. I never would have made it in marriage apart from Jesus. I, I don't even know that I would have made it this long in life apart from Jesus. So it's not self-hatred. It's recognition that anything that's good within me, anything that's good within you is because Jesus showed up. Amen. Amen. The people who tend to be the most gracious are those who know how badly they need grace. It's the ones that know that they're in a room, they're in a conversation, they're in a relationship, they're in a position that they're not qualified for. There's a story where a a Pharisee, a a religious leader, had invited Jesus to his home for the sake of having dinner. And in dinner, dinner in their time was a lot different than ours. I mean, we'd run through McDonald's, grab some fast food, eat in the car, do our thing, and then say, hey, have a good night. It was like a a full-blown banquet in that day. They lounged, they laid, they hung out, they communed. It was a big deal to come in your house. Jesus goes to the Pharisee's house and a woman of the streets finds out that Jesus is coming and she comes into the home, says that she comes behind him and, and begins to pour this expensive perfume onto his feet. She's crying and her tears are washing his feet and she's drying his feet with her hair and the, the, the Pharisee is watching this happen and he's smart enough not to say it, but he's stupid enough to think it. And he thinks to himself, oh, this can't be a man of God because he would know what kind of woman is touching him. And Jesus knew exactly his thoughts. And he said to this Pharisee in Luke 7, 47, she has been, been, she has been forgiven She's been forgiven of all her many sins. This is why she has shown me such extravagant love. But those who assume they have very little to be forgiven will love me very little. I love that I just heard that across the room because it makes me reassured that you can identify with what I'm about to say. I do not believe, and I think this daily, I do not believe I've ever lived up to the grace of God that's been given to me. And I recognize that the freedom and the forgiveness is big. That I know what it's like to be bound. I know what it's like to not be alive in Christ. And I relate to this woman. I relate to the fact that she's overwhelmed, that she's been brought into the presence of God. So we receive from God and we receive others right where they're at. We respond with the same extravagant grace that's been given to us. We we give grace to others. It's hard. That's the hard work. Loving God's easy. That's the easy part, is loving the other people. That's hard. It's releasing. How how many know that we tend to identify people by their dysfunction? You've done it. I've done it. We see examples of this in Scripture. There's there's the ministry team that traveled with Jesus, his his entire uh, uh, on-earth ministry, And Jesus had just been crucified. Jesus had been put into the grave. And the team is gathered together. They're hiding. They're freaked out. And rightfully so. They're like, Jesus is God. And he died. We watched him. We watched them put him in the tomb. And they're hiding. And they're thinking, we're next. Well, then this resurrected Jesus, apparently walking through walls, comes into the room. And and the, the team is excited. But there was one fella who was still wrestling with what was going on. How many know that we don't typically just say Thomas? What do we say? Doubting Doubting Thomas. You know what? One day we're going to meet him in heaven. He's going to go, don't you dare. (laughs) Can you imagine the one time that you're noted for doubting something and forever everybody refers to you as doubting Thomas? Last week, I taught about Bartimaeus, who was sitting at the edge of the road waiting for Jesus to come by. You, you won't find a preacher alive that doesn't, school, doesn't refer to him as blind Bartimaeus. We tend to identify people by their dysfunction. There's a man in Scripture, we don't even get his name. He's referred to as the man with the withered hand. Why don't we call him the man with one good hand, go. right? How about the man with two good legs? but we tend to identify people by their dysfunction. And this is is something that if we're not careful, will creep into the church. We need to be reminded that Jesus did not come to rub people's noses in their failures. He came to release them from death and bondage. He didn't come to identify with, have them re-reminded where they came from, what they've done. 
No, that's the voice of the accuser. Jesus is the one who came to release us from those things, to set us free, that we might experience newness of life. Jesus doing what he does, he's ministering and he's teaching and he's just a few miles away from his dear friends, Lazarus, his two sisters, Mary and Martha. And while he's ministering, this, this messenger in there interrupts him and says, hey, the one you love, he's sick. That's all he says. He doesn't say what level, he doesn't say he's dying. He says he's sick. And so Jesus responds to the messenger, says, tell them that this won't end in death. So the messenger goes on his way, probably thinking that now that Jesus knows the one that he loves is sick is right behind him. But that's not what happens. Jesus continues to minister for a few more days. And by the time he makes his way over to the family, the sisters are hot. They're mad. They're disappointed. In fact, like, like a woman scorned, she don't wait for him to show up at the house. She meets him at the side of the city as he's coming in, and she accuses them. My brother would be alive today if you would have been here. And you know what? As he makes his way closer to the family, already knowing that he's going to resurrect Jesus, he still cries. There's something to that, that he's still related to them. He still mourned with them, even though he knew what he was about to do. He'd been dead for four days. And so now he's made his way over to the tomb. We pick it up in John eleven thirty nine. 39. Jesus told them, roll the stone aside. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. This is incredible. Resurrection and deliverance is smelly. My son, my youngest son, he, um, he loves to find little nuggets. And then I never know when it's coming, but he'll, he'll just throw them out there. And this past week, he had one of those epiphany moments that he just had to share while I was eating breakfast, okay? So we're, we're sitting there eating breakfast together, and he goes, hey, Dad, you, um, you know what it means when you smell something? I'm like, I'm still trying to wake up, bro. What are you talking about? He, he says, in order to smell something, you have to have little molecules, of the thing you're smelling inside your nasal cavity. Now, I don't know about you, but I thought about the worst thing I've ever smelled. <laughs> Meaning I had a little portion of that in my nose. Oh. And then I read this, that Lord, the smell is gonna be terrible. And I wrote down, this means that we must be close or within close proximity of people who are dead or in need of deliverance. Jesus doesn't do his work from a distance. He always does it while he's near. Let's pick it up in verse number four. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside and then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all those people standing here so they will believe that you sent me. And then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. I'm, church, I've read this. I have preached this. I have looked at these verses so many times. I've studied the words and the, this took out to me totally different. Remember, last week was how we relate to God, growth and influence this way. This week is how we relate to people this way. Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead, but his friends released him from his grave clothes. So good. Meaning, you're not the one that produces the resurrection power, it's Jesus, but healing and deliverance happens in community. Amen. There are some folks that we know that we need to have contact, communication with Jesus so they, they come alive. But I don't know about you, but that night for me in October of 1992, when, when I surrendered my life to Christ, I, I'll say it this way, I didn't find him. I was the one who was lost. He found me. And when I, my, my life was instantly changed, I had no words for it. I didn't know anything about the Bible. My friends asked me on Monday, what happened? I said, I got saved. And the only reason I knew what that was is because that's what they told me. And they're like, what's that mean? I said, I don't know. 
And the one, one guy, he was smarter than me. He goes, you mean like you found religion? I said, yeah, I guess so. Obviously, I didn't, but I didn't know any better, right? I didn't know the stuff. And I was radically changed, even though I didn't know the first thing about what happened, but I was different. But I also know this, that just because my life and my spirit was made new, there was still a lot of areas where I was bound. And there was a lot of areas that I didn't see clearly yet. And it was the church, the body of Christ, my friends who helped set me free, that walked with me, discipled me, loved me. And so I'm committed to this because of the great men and women and and patriarchs and matriarchs of the faith who have served me so well. And and I'm not a man that's here on his own. Like Sir Isaac Newton says, if I see further than anybody, it's because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. And so Jesus resurrects, but we, the body of Christ, we help set people free and finally replace. I don't know how long I've been out of time. Am I doing okay, everyone? We're, on our, we're, we're coming in for a landing, which really isn't true. That's what pastors say so that you can kind of situate your butt in your chair, okay? <laughs> replace. Mark chapter eight, really, uh, we are getting close. Mark chapter eight, verse number 22. It says, and they came to Bethsaida, And some people brought a man who was blind to Jesus and begged him to touch him. One translation says that some friends brought a man to Jesus. They don't ask him to do anything but touch him. They know that one touch from Jesus is enough. They bring him to Jesus and would you touch him? Taking the man, Jesus, taking the man who was blind by the hand, he brought him out of the village. And after spitting in his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and he said, uh, I see people for, I see them like trees walking around. Then again, he laid his hands on his eyes and he looked intently and he was restored and he began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Spitting in his eye. This just demonstrates really how good God is because there was an understanding of the day that there was medicinal purpose in our spit and Jesus met him where he was at. I think that's part of it anyway. Jesus takes the man by the hand and leads him out of the village, which I think is, is pretty interesting. And then once he prays for him, he says, can you see? And he says, well, not exactly. It looks like trees walking around, which begs to ask the question, How did he know what trees look like? Meaning he wasn't born blind. Something hurt him or some type of damage happened to his eyes and he lost his sight. There's people in your life, perhaps some of you here tonight, that you've lost your sight. Something damaged you and you need need help, a touch from God to begin to see clearly again. He takes him out of the village and I'm sure there's so much more to this, but can I just submit to you that your village determines your vision? It didn't say that that was his home. He said, but don't go back there. Like it or not, people influence you. Like it or not, your community has an impact. Like it or not, people in your family, even though the heritage might be terrible and the traditions they're passing down might be rotten, they want you to be rotten. It was was a strange thing. When I got saved, my family was cool with that at first. Well, then my life began to change and then they freaked out. I'm like, but I'm kind of being good now. Like, my life is improving. And that this freaked them out. My family thought I was in the cult. And then when Becky and I got married, moved to, to, to Wisconsin, they thought, oh, they've got them now. They're whisking my kid out of here. What's the point here? That we need to become a village, a people that model what it looks like to be men of God, women of God, marriages that are anointed by God. We need to model what it looks like to live in victory, how to fight well, how to stand in faith. We need to be a village for people. And by the way, when people first begin, they are messy. Come on, how many know infants, as cute as they are, the return on investment takes a long time? I think it's God's gift that they're cute. So we don't harm them, right? I mean, for real. I, I've been through this. I'm like waking up screaming, crying in the middle of the night. I have to work, right? It's changing poopy diapers without one single thank you, right? It's crying without telling you what they want. But we know that if we nurture them and grow them, they will eventually become mature. 
Can we stop expecting that people that are brand new, literally babes in the faith, expecting them to live like you, especially if you've been walking with Jesus for any length of time? Amen. Amen. It's unity with diversity. We should have people of every aspect of their faith walk represented in our church. That to me is what a healthy church looks like. I want to show you a video. And as, I, as, we, as we get prepared to show it, let me just warn you. It, there's two times that the speaker uses hell in this. Now you're going to have heard it three times because I just said it. Just know this. Okay, look, I'm not, I'm not endorsing using cuss words. And, and I, 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 I don't want you to miss the value of the message because he uses it. Um, and frankly, if you've watched television, you know, you've heard the word. You know, we, we can get past it, right? Okay. This is a, a priest, Father Gregory Boyle, who started a, 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 a nonprofit called Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles County. Los Angeles County has the largest gang population in the world, and Homeboy Industries now is the largest gang rehabilitation center in the world. And in one of their, their operations, they have what's called Homeboy Coffee. And Father uh, Boyle was invited to speak at a commencement, and I want to share this with you as we get ready to wrap up. It's been the privilege of my life for 30 years to have been taught everything of value by gang members. And in the last few years, they've taught me how to text, and so I'm really grateful to them because <laughs> I find it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. And, and I'm pretty dexterous at it, uh, LOL and OMG and BTW, and the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for Oh, hell no. <clears throat> and I've been using that one quite a bit lately. <laughs> My alma mater, Gonzaga University, uh, called me and said uh, they were going to have a big talk on a Tuesday night with a thousand people. And so I, you know, uh, I said, sure. And they said, can you bring two homies with you? And I always pick homies who have never flown before just for the thrill of seeing gang members panicked in the sky. I've never picked anybody more terrified of flying than this guy Mario. He was just absolutely petrified. In fact, he was hyperventilating. <gasps> and we hadn't even boarded the plane yet. And then our, our flight crew arrives and I see two flight attendants, females, and they both have very large cups of Starbucks coffee and they're schlepping up the front steps. And Mario goes, when are we gonna board the plane? I said, as soon as they sober up the pilots, I should tell you that Mario in our 30 year history at Homeboy is the most tattooed individual who's ever worked there. His arms are all sleeved out, neck blackened with the name of his gang, head shaved, covered in tattoos, forehead, cheeks, chin, eyelids that say the end so that when he's lying in his coffin, there's no doubt. And so I'd never been in public with him and we're walking and people are like this and mothers are clutching their kids more closely. And I'm thinking, wow, isn't that interesting? Because if you were to go to Homeboy on Monday and ask anybody there who's the kindest, most gentle soul who works there, they won't say me, they'll say Mario. He sells baked goods at the counter at our cafe. He's proof that only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of changing the world. So the nighttime talk comes and it's a thousand people and I invite them up to share their stories in front of all these people for five minutes each. They were terrified, but they did a good job. And honest to God, if their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched. I invite them up for Q&A and and I said, yes, ma'am. And a woman stands and she says, yeah, I got a question. It's for Mario. First question out the gate. And Mario steps up to the microphone. He's a tall drink of water, skinny and clutching the microphone. And he's terrified. Yes. And she says, well, you say you're a father and you have a son and a daughter who are about to enter their teenage years. What advice do you give them? What wisdom do you impart to them? And Mario clutches his microphone and he's just terrified and he's trembling and he's getting a hernia trying to come up with whatever the hell he's gonna say when, when finally he blurts out, I just, and he stops and he retreats back to his microphone clutching terrified retreat. 
but he wants to get this whole sentence out. I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence until the woman who asked the question stands and now it's her turn to cry and she says, why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are loving, you are kind, you are gentle, you are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And a thousand total perfect strangers stand and they will not stop clapping. And all Mario can do is hold his face in his hand so overwhelmed with emotion that this room full of people, strangers, had returned him to himself and they were returned to themselves. And I think you go from here to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And you stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. And you stand with those whose dignity has been denied. And you stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And you stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. Make those voices heard. There's a few statements that he made in that closing speech, and I'll, I'll wrap it up with this. He says, you go to stand with the demonized so the demonizing will stop. You stand with the disposal, disposable. So the day will come when we stop throwing people away. You stand with those who, whose dignity has been denied. You stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And you stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. I think more than anything in my life or in my ministry, if I could be known for somebody who stands with all of what we just read right there. And further than that, if we would be committed to being a church that would stand with them as well. I believe that we're on the cusp of a day we may not see just simply because of demographics. We may not see gang members like they're seeing in L.A. County. But I promise you, there are those that have their past tattooed all over their imagination. And they don't need you and I to remind them of where they came from. What they need is a touch from heaven. And they need the body of Christ to love them and walk with them and to quit throwing people away. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? I need to pray over you and also pray over our children's workers and thanking them for their longevity. Father, thank you so much for meeting with us here tonight. I believe we're all leaving here changed. We thank you for meeting us in such intimate ways. And Father, I make no assumptions across this room that each one of us here today has already encountered your grace, your rescue, your saving uh, son who died in our place that we might live. And so in this atmosphere, in this environment, my prayer for each soul, that there would be a moment of courage, the courage that would yield us or cause us to yield to you, to your lordship, to be in a posture where our, our, our hearts are open, our hands are open wide, that we would receive the grace that not only covers us, but cleanses us. And love that is demonstrated before there's any attaboys, good boys or good girls. You show up, you invade, you rescue. My prayer is that none of us would leave this place without that encounter, that touch, without that reassurance. There's no reason for one of us, any of us, to leave with the burdens that we carried. There's no reason for us to go in the guilt and shame that we came in. But we walk out of this place free and light, committed to being ones who follow you, that the grace of God will not be wasted on us, but we will be ones who freely give. We will respond to others like you respond to us. We will release people from the history and the dysfunctions, and we will be agents of change as the Holy Spirit empowers us to do. And we will help create a village, a place for them to find growth and strength and stability. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.